This presentation is about language, the way that it has been handled in India, especially the written version of the language as it occurred from Ashoka's time till today. There are a lot of stories that are being told about the type and the writing systems of India. What I have to say here in the few minutes that are available to me is about the story of A, uh, just one of those characters of the Indian alphabet. It happens to be the very first alphabet that is normally learnt in any one of the systems. And it is of importance that it is also being studied a little later by mathematical methods that are available to us. Paleography is one of those subjects which talks about how characters change their shapes, how different writing systems merged and got created, and many one of those issues are normally handled in paleography. Up to now, paleography has been totally mechanical, and we also make an effort to use some mathematical methods that are available to us to study these kinds of things. A, uh, the very first character, as we say, also happens to be the background of this very first slide that you see, in which the reversed or the negative or the white sort of lines show about the shape of uh, uh, as it occurred in Brahmi. It is also claimed that all the Indian writing systems, whether it is uh, from north or from south, the entire country borrowed the writing system or developed the writing system based on Brahmi. This may be a half-truth when we study it paleographically and possibly by some mathematical means. Well, this is an attempt to do exactly that kind of a thing. In the classical literature, the first mention of writing comes out with a very important picture which most of the Indians are quite accustomed to. Vyasa Maharshi, a saint and also a great author, a great writer of his time, wrote something like 200,000 lines of text of Mahabharata. And in fact, he composed it and created it, but did not write it. He asked for the help of Lord Ganesha, an elephant god, just to write those things down. I have even have a suspicion that Vyasa did not know how to write, and he has to take the help of Ganesha, the scribe, to do the writing for him. Well, we'll see what exactly it is about. It is also true that at the time of writing Mahabharata, there was really no writing system available in the country to the best of our knowledge. But at an earlier time, the Rig Veda and the oral system that existed at that particular time somehow created or sometimes carried over all the available literature of the time, which could be collect, considered approximately as a collection of folk data or folk literature of that particular time, written in an archaic language called Vedic Sanskrit. Everything belonged to at least some 10 centuries before Christ and earlier, nothing later. But the Indian thinkers and the linguists of that particular time developed a very peculiar system of remembering this text or writing it as if in their brain. And that is how it has been carried for at least the last 30 centuries and continues to remain so without any interpolation, without any modification or corruption. This is a record by itself as it happens. So in a way, writing was not necessary for the early rishis and even the ones for the ones who remember it now. But we also have some other forms of writing that exist. The language itself was studied in great detail by great grammarians called Panini and Patanjali. And in fact, at least some 10 to 20 grammarians of that particular time who contributed a lot. Though the West saw the rise of phonology and phonetics, only in about 17th century, the AD, well, at least some six or seven centuries before Christ, 
Panini wrote his great memorandum called the Attadhyayi, a study of how exactly Sanskrit has to be created and how exactly a language has to be understood and formed kind of a thing. But even at that time, whether there was any writing is still doubtful. We really have no idea if at all a writing system existed. It was a closely guarded secret of the priest class and it was never publicized. But it came into the real common man only after Ashoka the Great and the Jains and Buddhists of the time, 3rd century BC and approximately that time, put it into public use in the form of inscriptions that came out at that particular time. It was not exactly the case that no writing existed earlier to Pandini or Ashoka kind of a thing. There were these Indus Valley seals or the Harappan seals as they call them. There was some writing, there were some pictures that were written, which so again of quite a good quality. But all these things were really has not, not been deciphered even till today. What language they are in, what exactly they contain is not known. Basically because very long texts have not been found and still it has not been settled whether the script itself contained any phonetics or any language at all or was it only some numbers and that kind of things that it indicated. What you see here written are a few characters from a book that was printed by uh, created by uh, Iravada Mahadevan, a learned scholar from Tamil Nadu, who, uh, who wrote a book on the concordance of the Indus Valley script and Tata Press created individually all these characters that were required for printing. As luck would have it, this is the first time that an Indian language was printed using a computer and the concordance also was created using a computer. So it is only for historicity's sake that I have got this kind of a thing. But Harappan writing, even if it existed, was never understood by the common man or it was not the common man's piece of cake at all. That was not the case with Brahmi. When Ashoka the Great came out with his Dhamma inscriptions or inscriptions asking for better behavior of people, to love each other and to be honest to each other. He created all the kinds of pillar inscriptions, cave inscriptions and everything came up. And the expanse of this was quite large. Right from Gandhar in north, the present Afghanistan in that sense, where they had multilingual or multi-script writings, including Brahmi. The ones in Girnar, the ones in Nepal and the ones in south at Brahmagiri all were written in the Brahmi script of that particular time. The, the language that was used in those particular cases was Prakrit. It was a variation of Sanskrit or a local language which borrowed quite a lot at a later time from Sanskrit, but it was not Sanskrit. Incidentally, the very name Sanskrit was invented only in about 7th century AD and the Sanskrit was not known by that name. It was just called a language, Bhasha or Brahmi or anything else at that particular time. The origin of Brahmi. The people who worked on Brahmi script think that it came as if from nowhere into the Afghan region or the Bactrian region at some time. And it made its, when it came itself, it came as a almost a major enough and a complete enough kind of a script that was good enough for all kinds of use by everyone else. So there are again doubts as to what exactly is the origin of Brahmi. Many people think that at least in Ashoka's time there were schools where writing was taught and writing in Brahmi was taught, especially with the Pali language in mind, possibly not every other character. But all that is required for representing Pali were taught at that particular time. This in a way excludes all other things. But what exactly were the phonemes or phonetic basis of characters they had? 
there are certain doubts and clarifications that are required. I'll just rush through them. One of them is the Ayyubun, a particular order, a very scientific and technical order that has been recorded by Panini as Mahayachar Sutras, as the introduction to his book Ashtadhyayi. Varnamala tradition, that is the Aai and Kakhaga tradition, which is extant and everyone uses that as of now. And we also have a odd theory by some of the people who worked on Brahmi, especially of an Aramic origin and a Karoshti origin or a Persian origin for the characters kind of a thing. And might be there are other sources of characters or there were other places from where it was born. Still, it is an unsolved problem in that kind of a sense. And we will try to see if mathematics again can provide some kind of an insight into this. This happens to be the Girnar inscription of Ashoka. The character that I have marked with an arrow happens to be the A uh of that thing. It occurs many times. You can see that this is not just a random cave inscription. It could be read even now, thanks to Princep. It is possible to read it. Yam, Dhammo and so on kind of a things as it happens. And then the building of lines and the approximate identical size of characters says that there is some discipline and order. It has been trained in writing it. It is not that he has just written it randomly or from anything else. We will see if this makes sense in whatever that follows. Brahmi paleography has been studied. There have been very important works by George Bula, Ahmad Asanzani, Raja Bali Pandey, Caldwell, Gauri Shankar Oza and so many others. All of them follow the mechanical method as I told you earlier. And that is exactly the reason it reminds us of the old hot metal days. It is something which cannot be created or modified mathematically. There was no mathematical model available for those kinds of things. Today, as it happens, every character that we write uses the computers. The moment it goes into the computer, it has to be mathematically defined. And that is exactly the reason we thought we will do a better job with this digital paleography, as you would like to call. We borrowed very heavily from Professor Don Knuth of Stanford University, who had invented a technique called Metafont. We also in, done a, did a lot of learning again from John Vernon, the co-founder of Adobe Systems, who developed a system called Postscript. All these are mathematical definitions of lines and curves from which it is possible to build characters and from characters a language. Our dream is goes a little further than this. In fact, we are wondering whether using lines, scripts or mathematical methods, is it possible to create a universal script that could be intuitively understood, terms expandable and so on, but it's better to dream than not to dream. That's exactly what we carry. All the characters that go into a font are definition of characters. They consist of lines and curves. Obviously, it depends on the kind of medium on which it has to be written. And obviously, the lines and curves have to be drawn by a pen or sometimes a chisel and hammer if that happens to be something else. But that is what we sort of carry around. These definitions of how the pen or the chisel has to move, how wide it has to be, all can be defined at some time or the other mathematically, exactly by the methods of Don Knuth, John Vernock and us in that particular sense. We also have a very interesting study. Instead of going for every other character for which there is no time, we really do not know how many characters go. I have decided to sort of go with only one character, a, uh, which is that is why we call this the a uh story, talking about it mathematically, again the contribution of various factors that are involved in that. It is always our dream to add something more. There is someone, a grammarian, officially, 
who sort of uh, preceded or was at the contemporary of Panini at that particular time, approximately 6th, 7th or 10th century before Christ. The one who thought that voice or the sound has to be produced with the tool, it requires the space and it requires the time and it requires the human effort to do that. And that is the indication that it is something like a it's not an unknown natural sound. It is something that is created. So the language also is done with created sounds, not exactly by accidental sounds. That is what exactly the concept is. Whether these are applicable even to writing is a question that we would like to answer as we go by. There are other reasons to talk about. Uh, I incidentally, in the first phonetic character that has to be codified, in all script systems that we know, it is Aleph in Arabic and all the languages of that time. It is A in all the Indian languages. It is A which sounds like A in English language and virtually every other language has A as the base character. So that's one of the reasons. In the Brahmi, lot of characters that we just saw, A happens to be the most complex of the characters. We'll try to answer why that happens also. We also have another reason that A is acrophonic with Agni. Agni, which is the name for fire, both in Prakrit and Agni, Agni in Prakrit and Agni in Sanskrit, effectively means that these characters start with A and might be, we have a clue here, that A could be a name of Agni in that sense. It may be some shape corresponding to that. We also have a little of divinity coming in. Krishna in Bhagavad Gita states that his Akaranam Aksharomi, I am the one who is the A sound, the first primordial sound in the, al the set of alphabets kind of a thing. But all that apart, we go into mathematical methods and see if there is an advantage in using mathematical methods. Here, in both these pictures, I have selected six identical points. The points are six in each. They are identical in both the pictures. The only instructions that I've got as to how the pen has to move from that point and how it has to join the next point is defined in red, as you would see. If I make it down and right and up and right in here, I get a Brahmi A. If I make it right and left and right and left, in this particular case, it becomes a Devanagari A. The time that you have carried or cleared between these two is at least some 17 centuries. So that is the kind of power that a small instructional chain can do to the same set of points, same lines and same curves, some part of which is remaining unchanged. The next thing that I've got is something very important. This is an animation of a character of Brahmi A leading itself to Devanagari A over time. The change that you see is gradual. Possibly each of those steps corresponds to approximately one century. We do not know. But that is what the entire thing is about. From this animation, I want to learn some such things. That animation could be the kind of change that was introduced by the artisan, the medium, or time, or whatever it is. But what we saw tells us a few things. All the, it appears possible that it doesn't look like a sort of a bold plumbu, something which is understandable. The change appears natural. It's sort of from one copy, when he copies it to the next, might be that kind of a change might have happened. It is possible to sort of derive, maybe it is possible to derive a few other characters other than A uh, by the same kind of a technique. But the last is particularly important, that all the intermediate steps that you saw, with the spacing of one second difference between them, are still creatable. It is possible to find inscriptions with all those kinds of models that are there. With this as our background, let us try to see another little example that we have got in the future. As I told earlier, 
quite a few of the earlier paleographic authors thought that the Aranic Aleph was the mother of Brahmi uh, or it was derived from that. Monier Williams in particular, the author of the famous Sanskrit English dictionary, thought exactly that way. We'll just see whether it is possible to do and find out if it is feasible with the small animation that we have got. This is the Aleph of Aramic, which indicates the face of a bull in that particular sense. Aleph corresponds to a bull. And it sort of undergoes changes and sort of ends up with the Brahmi A, which can be identified as a Brahmi A. What are your readings about it? What I saw and thought is what I'm trying to tell you here. It looks very difficult to impossible. Intermediate steps have not been formed anywhere, especially in the location where such Brahmi occurred at a later time. But then if someone says that this is the only way that it has been done, we can't disagree with them. But the tool and artisan factor does not come in at all. No artisan, and especially if he is trained, would like to put a next line on top rather than at the bottom. The time frame that is involved in this change also is particularly small. So the entire thing appears a bit of far-fetched one. We don't want to be rough on our statements, otherwise we would have said it's impossible. Then we tried a different set of methods just to see whether it is possible to derive the Grantham Tamil A uh, from Brahmi A uh, and we succeeded approximately this way. This is the Brahmi A uh, where the right hand side I have sort of rounded off for some reason. If we instead of ending here, we continue to not to lift our pen and continue. We would end up with a character of this kind. It's drawn slightly bigger for a different reason. Now, mathematically, it is like adding a new line. But then I combined the two lines and made it a single line from here to here. And that is the draw. And well, the vertical line makes the Tamil or Brahmi A. Put on that a bit of a decoration and we end up with the Grantham A. It appears very feasible, very derivable and very possible in that particular sense. That is what I have explained even in this. Then we have Shatavahana artisans who brought in Brahmi A, Brahmi A, modified to their convenience and inscribed them in the inscriptions that happened about 1st century CE to possibly a few hundred years back kind of a thing. All this happened approximately in the Karnataka, Andhra, Odisha belt for that matter. Sannati, one of the important Buddhist centers, happens to be in this particular area. And that also has Satavahana inscriptions of that particular time. They had a little habit of rounding it up, putting a bit of a serif on top, rounding the bottom instead of drawing it correctly. This kind of a change, what exactly the reason is what we would like to understand and appreciate at a later time. So the Brahmi A from the north moved east and became a Devanagariya, came down south, went a little further and became the Grantha and the Tamil A. And centuries earlier to this, it also led to an A of this particular kind, the Satavahana A. We again do a little of morphing and a little of a uh, animation just to see whether from this Shatavana A, an A which is prevalent in the same region of Telugu and Karnataka and the Orisha area, the Kannada A, whether it could be derived at all. You could see that what you end up with is a Kannada A, what you started with was a Shatavana A. What we have here is the story of a Shatavana A how it came down to Karnataka and made its own, went for its own modifications in that kind of a sense. What you see on the left most part of your screen is the Shatavahana A, which happened between 1st century BC and 1st century AD. 
the shatavahana uh, underwent modifications from the brahmi uh, to add a serif kind of a line on top and a little of curvature at the bottom which we explained even earlier the question is whether this led to the kannada a uh, which came into its existence in about 7th century and later uh, times the next two pictures that we have got the latter two pictures are from a different origin the one in the middle is the kalyana chalukya a uh, with its original as it appears and also a modification of that as done by an artist on top on the rightmost side of the screen you see another picture that is the a uh, from a stone inscription found somewhere near mangalore tokur which also has been dated to about 7th century ce what we have to say about is some modifications or some improvements on this kind of a thing the kind of conclusions that we can draw from this are a little peculiar and we will talk about it as we go by we go with a small hypothesis that the latter two characters that you saw the kannada as were derived from brahmi a or shatavahan a but possibly this process was something very peculiar very probably when the kannada was to be revived or up to that time most of the inscriptions came in brahmi and sanskrit language even some kannada inscriptions had brahmi characters in them but then finally when we had to go for an entire lot of kannada inscriptions they go for a revival of an old script which might have existed in this region especially the kannada telugu and odisha belt of south india and we propose and we suggest that this is exactly what has happened whether this can be a little controversial the assumption is a little bold but personally we do not doubt that such a thing has happened and it is such a thing which led to its own improvements and modifications when the character the kannada a had to be revived and to be reconstructed also in south at a later time something else happened which i will try to show in a little presentation that follows the artisan at talakadu the from the ganga dynasty who worked on an inscription dated 720 ce had as an option had two options of us one what that you saw was a brahmi a what you see now here is possibly a rudimentary kannada a he decided to sort of include them both and create a hybrid character from this lot and that is what he ended with an a uh, which has both these kinds of inscriptions both the kannada uh, and brahmi are uh, together so that you can never miss that kind of a thing the result is a hybrid uh, as you could see what you see on the left is what we have just sort of created by hybridization what you see on the right is an actual inscription from a 720 ce ganga inscription at that particular time which is of quite an importance as we go by now is the time to talk a little about another little thing that we have this comes from hours of discussion one of my friends a philosopher and guide for that matter professor shankar mogashi punekar we had in dharwad and bombay and darwad again at some other time this talks about stellar origins or the origins of characters in the sky there is a very peculiar reason that we need to tell you this this is a mantra from the rigveda mandala i have just marked all those things done i will read only the first line of it not exactly even the second line rucho akshare parame vyoman yasmin deva ali vishve nishedhu is the first sentence there is another sentence that follows i'll try to give you the english meaning straight away ralph at griffith translates it as this i can't understand what that means professor shankar mukashi punekar translates it in this way that in the high skies are inscribed the syllables of the vedic knowledge looks like a far cry but a poet 
a creative rishi could have done exactly this and nothing else and we have some other proofs to say that the stars were the reasons for writing the brahmi with, with this understanding that brahmi script possibly did not come entirely from ashoka it existed much earlier might be it was secretly being used by the priest class of that time so the priest class might have invented at least some characters of brahmi which might have come as buddhist and jain traditions of later time but it's considered the variation of the point it starts with this the first line actually starts with a small story that i need tell you my father when i was about 2 years old used to tell me that the stars in the sky are nothing but the embers of fire thrown from a bonfire in our village kind of a thing they went and got stuck and became stars vedas or vedic works also believe approximately that way the sukta that is just read the mantra that you read is from vishwadeva sukta there are 33 gods and 33000 reincarnations of them in the skies all of them are variations of fire all of them have names which start with agni and those kinds of things so the stars are still considered variations of agni so the a could exist with the stars there is a work which approximately happens again from the panini's contemporary time written in modern sanskrit known as lagada jyotish it's a book of astronomy which lists some of the constellations some 27 of them and in that it sort of assigns agni to kritika pleiades a star which i call a sky mark it is something which is beautiful identifiable easily located in the night sky and it has six or seven members within that kind of a thing at different times some people have called it six some have seven but that doesn't matter this incidentally also is supposed to have been mentioned even in the indus script or the harappan script at some time or the other there is another way of charting the skies with the alphabets known as avakada chakra in that again a is assigned the place with the same star kritika or the pleiades if we have six points that can be joined by some lines possibly we have a possibility of getting a uh, acrophonically or otherwise some kind of a thing it also explains approximately the complexity of a uh, why it is that complex compared to others also could be explained this way if we are trying to use the six stars of kritika as the base for whatever that we have to go you could see the six stars now are joined by four lines and we get a brahmi a uh, as it were from nowhere what we see here is a picture of the star a uh, from kritika drawn again what you saw last was an animation this is just a static picture just to tell you what the thing was about and around this brings us to the end of the story but we are left with a few questions which i would like to talk about in quite a detail is there anything like a pure script which developed by itself without the help and support of any other script was it all totally independent i personally believe that like languages which also depend on other languages script also depend on other scripts and there is always a huge exchange of scripts between south north and anywhere else for that matter and some of the stylizations that we see in the north indian scripts might have gone from south and i have not not much not much of a doubt left in that kind of a thing is that possible that in studying scripts these kinds of mathematical step, methods that we have employed to a very rudimentary extent can they be of any use is there something more that you can make out of it and can we study it differently can we also find some new applications for digital paleography instead of just defining characters obviously it can be used for character identification and things of that kind but many more things can happen in this particular order the last question that we raised was the last point that we discussed whether 
at least some of our characters, are they sort of dependent on the constellations? Constellations, the sky provides us some beautiful small inscriptions in a way, in the form of stars of different characters. Everyone is tempted to use them, to find a meaning for them and to find an association with them in language. Many stories of the Vedas, even from the Vedic times, are built on the constellations and on the stars. Some of the most strong characters, strong stories have been told from that kind of an origin. So can it be that this also contributed to some characters, some character shapes in the last question that we have got? I know that what we have done is just opening a Pandora's box. There are many more questions to be answered. This brings us to the end of our uh, show. Thank you very much for a patient listening and patient viewing. This has many more parts to follow that in the near future we will be bringing out many more issues on languages and linguistics, especially as seen by mathematicians and grammars. Thank you very much again.